Okay, yes, it's true, I do not have a cell phone. But not having a cell phone actually allows me to, to keep an anchor into the 20th century, so I'm able to, to have the context of the 20th century, but also the, you know, the experience of the 21st century. So I'm kind of in both two places at once, which is you know, kind of cool. You guys do this all the time. By the way, I see a bunch of uh, ex-students and students in this room, which I, I'm honored by. And uh, I feel like this is a privilege because over the years, I've learned a lot from you. And that actually relates very closely to, to my topic of today. What I've observed is that the, the direction of our thoughts and our actions has shifted dramatically from a predominantly vertical orientation to one that is more horizontal. We have made a shift from relations of power to relations of cooperation. This shift has revealed three features, or three pro protagonists, let's say, three motives that are, that are very conducive to a, a positive human experience. I want to examine them to see what possibilities they might uncover, one of which is a, a shot in the arm for the studies of the humanities, and the other is a healthy relationship between technology and society. OK, the three features. One, democracy, but not, ha not, not as how we traditionally understand it. Democracy more like a, a virtue, a spirit, something that can permeate all aspects of society. And the other is the idea of empowerment, an empowered individual who is also responsible. And the third one, the multiplication of contexts, contexts of free choice. Um, now, today, I'm going to talk about these three protagonists in a very abstract manner so that uh, they might be applied to any aspect of experience. These uh, protagonists should be encouraged because they constitute the means for a richer pool of resource, from a, a greater source of inspiration, whereby an average individual can participate with the technical design, where an average individual can voice uh, a hitherto unknown need around which technological design will crystallize. This cooperation between individuals and technology, that's lifting the black box, the lid of the black box, just a little bit to see what's inside. One example of this shift is our understanding of identity. In the past, or traditionally, identities are given to us. They are almost forced upon us. We receive them, we receive our names our languages, our cultures. We, even our jobs, our professions can be, can be associated with our identities. Now, the identity is a frontier. It is a, it is a horizon of opportunities, and we can gallop up and down that. We can chase the horizon. We can um, create new identities. This uh, is universal because it is quite natural. I imagine a, uh, a, a typical family dinner. You, uh, you sit down with your family. Um, Historically, traditionally, these dinners are characterized by silence, people staring at their screens, or maybe an occasional argument. However, as soon as you invite a guest over, everybody becomes the perfect host. The family's perfect, nobody chews with their mouth full, no, no, no elbows on the table, everybody looks perfect. Well, we are able to move in, in, in and out of context very easily. We're able to change, change our masks very easily this idea of moving in and out of context, the digital, the real, this is even a, a motif in, in the cinema. For instance, if you have, uh, you, you've seen Shrek, or one of the thousand versions of Shrek, where you've got Shrek arguing, negotiating with, his, with the donkey, and the donkey is being stubborn, and then Shrek looks to the audience and, and, do, and goes like that. Well, Shrek is fictional, but he's moving into the real world. We do this all the time as well. This is a very natural, free motion that we need to encourage. Moving from one context to another is a representation of freedom. Perhaps the most accessible uh, context creator is the cell phone. Yes, the cell phone uh, breaks down hierarchies. It eliminates uh, the concepts of time and space. Uh, those poor guys, time and space. We may not be talking about them in the generations to come. It might disappear. Well, what's important for, for our purposes today is that the cell phone allows us to maintain, modify, or obscure our identities. Again, the freedom. 
A new identity is a new resource. It helps us, if we have a new identity from which we are making decisions that promotes a democratic society, but it also allows us to add meaning to the world. If we are adding meaning to the world, we're almost like creators, we are like artists. That feels good. It feels good to participate in the world in that way. Well, if we are adding meaning to the world, we are, we are changing its concepts. Let's focus for a minute here on the concept of, of efficiency. Traditionally, efficiency, it helps us, I don't know, save time, save space, save effort, save money. It also requires a little bit of discipline. For instance, if, uh, if Netflix sends you 22 episodes of the first season of something, it takes a lot of discipline not to watch all 22 seasons in a weekend, which, you know, I'm guilty of. Well, efficiency is starting to change, and it is changing because of our interactions. To illustrate this, I like to, I like to use the metaphor of barn building. Building a barn with a bunch of your neighbors might not seem to be the most efficient activity in the world. Uh, it, it certainly is not in, in, in how we understand uh, efficiency now. But let's, let's really look at what's happening. We've got people on the roof. They are risking their lives. Meanwhile, people are communicating. They're getting to know one another. They're forming relationships. They're learning each other's strengths and weaknesses. This is solving problems before they happen. It's, it's strengthening the community. They're avoiding problems. That's a different form of efficiency. Analogously, we have similar initiatives today, like the one on the screen, where an individual can launch an idea, a project, and if he or she receives uh, resources, time, expertise, then that individual knows that his or her idea will be accepted before it goes onto the market. That's a new element to efficiency. Being able to change an idea as powerful as efficiency is a source of empowerment. Another source of empowerment is how we read, how we read today. Traditionally, uh, how, we read, how we read is is a little more passive. We read, we digest, we interpret, and perhaps we write something about it later, but it's still passive. How we read now is much more proactive. It is much more dynamic and active. We read a little bit of the text. We might click on a related link. We might Google something. We might find a YouTube video. We might text our friends. We might start a blog. This is where we, we see that empowerment is not just a a distant cousin or a less aggressive cousin than power. Empowerment is about sharing responsibilities. When you are blogging, you are receiving feedback, you are sharing the responsibility of that interpretation of the text. This is, this is responsible. We are not you know, experts, solitary experts. If how we read is changing, then it also stands to reason that, that our languages are changing as well. We have received languages. We, we, we are given languages. We even study them in the university, which is a bit ironic since traditional languages are disappearing. But even as these traditional languages are disappearing, we are creating new languages with our own audio and visual uh, interventions. This is nice. We are, creating how, we are recreating how we communicate. That is participating in the world in a very proactive way. A similar thing is happening with our with our cultural productions. Let's, let's focus on mythology for a moment here. Mythology, we receive it from above, we, we digest it, we interpret it, we act on it, perhaps. Now we have the ability to participate with our, our cultural productions as well as our mythologies, our traditions. Well, Star Wars exists in, in many different manifestations. Marketing, video, there's even probably some obscure novel uh, about Star Wars and uh, cartoons, but the video game. We can play the video game, we can hack, we can modify the rules. As we are doing that, there's a, people monitoring our behavior on the, in the digital world. After that monitor, we will change the product. We have a tight relationship with our cultural productions. You might wanna, you might think that if, we are be, if our behavior is being monitored, then we are giving ourselves up to this uh, this big brother idea. Well, that's not the case. Being watched is now a form of participation. Language and culture reflect 
the cooperation between various forms of expression. Our technologies are also harmonious and, and open. Traditionally, a technology is defined by its use. Now it's, a, it's more of a platform. It's, I, like to, I like to think of technology as a, as a dance floor, but in particular, a dance floor at a wedding. You know, somebody makes the dance floor, you get on the floor, and you're free to show your moves however you like. And you can't, you can't make fun of those people because it's for a good cause. Well, technologies of today are also a platform. Wikipedia is a platform. They make the platform, we show our moves. In a, in a similar fashion, the, uh, the classroom is a, is a platform. It's a dance floor where the, where the students can show their skills. A class, a platform, they have multi-purposes. Even traditional or singular technologies, singular artifacts, have a multi-purpose. For instance, this, uh, this Coca-Cola sign is not only um, designed to convince you to buy Coca-Cola or something, it is also participating with its environment. It has a, it has a lateral purpose. In addition, these, uh, these bicycles that you, you loan and you borrow with your credit card, etc., they are not only getting you from point A to point B, but they are also, they're generating certain values that strengthen your community. When I ride in EcoBC here in Mexico City, it's almost like I can feel the likes, you know, following me. This, this is strengthening values of a community. It's for a, a, common, a, a common cause, a common goal. These uh, subtle or lateral inspirations for technology call into question a traditional inspiration for technology. That of the idea of new. If it hasn't been done before, we, we got to do it. You know, if, if it's innovative, let's do it. If it was big, let's make it bigger. If it was wired, let's make it wireless. We are wowed by the new. However, being wowed by something is rather passive. With, with the advent of postmodernism, new morphed into something like fresh. Take uh, Homer Simpson. Every day, Homer Simpson encounters a new, a new adventure. But the next day, I mean, he might even get to be 65 years old. But for the next episode, he's back to being the 38-year-old balding gentleman that he was. That's fresh. Now fresh has evolved, in my opinion, to refresh. Yeah, we can watch the show, but we can also participate with the show. We can interact with it. And that interaction is being monitored. And we are, again, participating with the cultural product. This may seem like uh, launching a message in a bottle, but that message will be received. We don't want to just change the channel. We want to change the channel and change the product. But we want to have both. We want to have our cake and eat it, too. Okay, speaking of simultaneous uh, contexts, uh, I, I've been using these images for years because I've had a, a question. Why are these depictions of reality bathed in information? Why, do we, why are we obsessed with making real people into cartoons? Why do we need to di uh, digitalize them? Well, I was asking the wrong question. No, it wasn't a why, it was what do we get? For instance, one could say that by making Keanu Reeves into a cartoon, we are creating layers between us and reality, or we are enhancing reality. Well. It's like asking the question of, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Well, the sound of one hand clapping is not a sound at all. It's a, it's a wave. Okay, well, what do we get by having two different contexts at the same time? We have two realms within which we can make choices, increasing the value of democracy in our society. Speaking of the real, the, the institution of problem solving, I like to use the, the metaphor of a hospital. Let's say you, uh, you go to a hospital with some bizarre symptoms. Uh, you're cutting your fingernails, and it makes you have nightmares, and your hair falls out. Well, the hospital's not going to say, I'm sorry, that, uh, that symptom is not on our list of symptoms. No, they're going to try to adapt to the symptom. They're going to adapt to the current problem. This is happening in a world of spontaneity, where you don't necessarily need to be right. You just need to be correct in order to solve the problem. Another institution that is evolving 
besides problem solving, is, is politics or our understanding of democracy. Democracy, in my opinion, is, is rather violent. It is almost a reflection of the law of the jungle, where if you're bigger and stronger, you win. If you have more money, you win. Well, I think we can evolve past that. Uh, nowadays, we have the means to choose the problem, choose how to solve the problem, and then choose who can help you solve the problem. Choose the representatives. And actors, you know, George Clooney and Brad Pitt, they're always game to support a lost cause or a, or a, or a very beneficial cause. So that shouldn't be a problem. All you need to do is to communicate, be organized, and be able to negotiate the internet. Do you need to be 18 to do that? No. If in a hyper-democratic world where children are participating in democracy or in politics, responsibility has a new meaning. It is more intimate. It is closer to home. This certainly warrants another look at the humanities. This will help us uncover our potential, our possibilities. We will be redefining humans, and a new human will have a new need. These needs will require technical design to address those needs. Average individuals, we are the voice of innovation. We are participating in the technical design. Again, we are lifting up the black box. Uh, I was re researching uh, gamification a few months back, and I came across this image, and I was like, what? Where have I seen that before? You know, it, made, it made me feel younger. It made me feel, in fact, it made me feel good. Well, it reminded me of this. I'm thinking, if, if, if they're doing this while we're playing video games, well, this must be some sort of a, a link, some sort of a timeless motivation. An incentive to participate in technical design is an incentive to create one's reward, one's own path of reward. Along that path, you are making decisions. You are, you're, it's promoting a democratic society. The scarecrow, he never got a heart, or he never got a brain, but he made friends along the way, and he was also making decisions along the way. A trophy is predetermined. A trophy was given to us, but choosing our own reward path, that's more, that's more democratic. It's promoting an individualized society. If individuals are not only participating in the language creation, creation of cultural products, and participating in the technological design, well, then we definitely need to take another look at the humanities. The humanities need to guide technological design. How do we establish this link between the two? We encourage the three, the three, fe three features I mentioned earlier, the three protagonists. These things will help us know what is right. 